Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are reading from Galatians chapter 5, starting at verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now, let me stop there and go back to you can do the things that you would. There are many people that yield to the flesh from moment to moment. And some do it at the most inopportune moment. And the reason they do it at the most inopportune time is because they have what the Bible calls incontinence. It's a lack of self-control or they can only operate under self-control sporadically. And sporadically, they don't. So you never know when they're going to suffer from foot-in-mouth disease. And as a result, people get hurt, people get angry, people get resentment, and people can be totally turned away from God by our lack of self-control. So I'm going to read 15 one more time. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Now I'm going to tell the story, then I'm going to continue reading because I'm not done. There was a lady I knew years ago, and there were about four of us together, and some of the people that were there did not know me from Adam. They met me once or twice, but they didn't really know me. And this one woman was talking to a family member who happened to be older than she was. And this woman, she was a churchgoer. She was faithful. She was all that in a bag of chips, had her life together. I wish my finances were half as together as she is. She is what you call established financially. You hear me? All right. She had one of those sporadic moments where she lacked self-control. She and her brother were talking about something, and she got upset with her brother because he did not change the light bulb. So when she walks in a particular room and sees the light bulb is not working, she calls him. He comes in the room. She says, didn't I tell you to change that light bulb? And he said, I just forgot. That's all. And then she jumps into him. You are so lazy. You are trifling. You're shiftless. You're good for nothing. I don't know why I even bother letting you stay with me. I should put you out on the street. You're just a lazy, good for nothing bum. You could have got your little lazy butt up. Going into the hallway, got the light bulb, and it doesn't take a rocket science to stand up on a step stool and change a light bulb. What the H is the matter with you? Blah, blah, blah. And I mean, she let her rip. And the man is standing there. He wasn't arguing with, him, with her. He wasn't frustrated. He wasn't offended until she dissed him in front of all of us. And he just walked out. He was like, later for you, girl. Here's the sad part. The brother was not saved yet. He was just starting every once in a while to come and visit the church I, I had started up in Altadena. That was the end of him coming. All right. That's biting and devouring. Because the same thing could have been said in private. Pull him aside. One time I walked in the hair salon 
And I remember one of the hairdressers laid into me. All the customers sitting around, minding theirs, the other hairdressers, she bawling me out for not for, for turning on the air conditioner full blast because I'm wasting the owner's electricity. Number one, I don't even like air conditioning. I got to be desperately hot to turn that bad boy on. Number two, I was always considering the owner's electric bill, so I would only turn on what was necessary. I already was there. But I didn't argue. I let her ball me out. She balled me out, balled me out. And, and I don't know what's wrong with you and why you can't. You know, you're a grown woman. You got enough sense to know. And blah, 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 blah. Well, she didn't know that I knew I told her afterwards. So later on, when I got through with my customer's hair, and all the time I'm praying, Lord, knock the anger out. Knock the anger out. You know, give me that self-control so I don't. Uh, shame you when I get through telling, you know, giving her the truth when I get through laying that out to her. So I'm waiting for that opportune moment and I'm using the Holy Spirit self control. And when I'm done and she has a break, I walk over to her quietly under my breath. Come with me to the kitchen. I got to tell you something. So she looks at me. And she follows me to the kitchen like, now what the heck is this? Is You know, what what's this about? And I told her, number one, I have never disrespected you in public, but you just did. Number two, you should get the facts before you jump off on your little soapbox. The owner was the one that turned on the air conditioning, not me. So before you jump into somebody's case, why don't you get all the facts straight first? Why don't you ask a few questions before you start passing judgment and condemning at the same time? Why don't you do that first? And she had nothing else to say, but I, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. I said, I understand that. But that could have been discussed in private. Couldn't it have? You didn't have to diss me in front of everybody, did you? No, you're right. I said, okay, I'm done. That's all I wanted to say. It's over. I was able to turn and face God without giving him shame or having to apologize. And the Lord enabled me to just forgive and, get, and be done with it. But what I want to share with you is that tends to be a problem. And she was a Christian too, especially with God's people. Um, the one thing that I can honestly say is there are times when we feel like we've got to say what we've got to say now. Now, it's got to be said now. I can't wait. It's burning in my spirit. It's shut up in my bones. But it ain't the fire of the Holy Ghost. A lot of times it's the fire of hell anointing your tongue to work for the enemy. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. We have to be very, very careful how we talk to people, how we treat people, how we respond to counseling, how we respond to teaching, how we respond to constructive criticism. We have to be careful about that. And we have to be careful how we respond to how we perceive as other people's shortcomings. Now, let me continue reading. Verse 17. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to another, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led by the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, what that means by not being able to do the things that you would, let me share this with you. I know a man years ago he's dead now i know a man who used to be a taxi driver 
And I had been witnessing to him for ages because I was catching the taxi all the time. He told me, he said, just call my name when you want a taxi. I'll, I'll get you. And what ended up happening after I witnessed to him several, several, several times is he ended up sharing with me one day because he decided he wanted to be more than friends and I let him know I'm not looking for anything, we'll just be friends. So every once in a while he'd take me out to dinner, we talk or whatever. And he decided he wanted to show me a video of a movie he was in. That was a pretty good movie. And when I watched him act, I was like, this man can act. He's at the level of Sean Connery, Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman, Brad Pitt. He's up there, baby. He's up there. And I'm watching him and I said, wow, this is heavyweight right here. This is a big number. So I was impressed by his acting ability. Now, this is what the, the Lord showed me. I learned this from him first hand. I asked him, why were you not in more movies with your acting ability? He started cussing, talking about, now he was not saved yet. Started cussing, talking about how uh, he always had issues with the people on the set and the, <clears throat> and the stupid you-know-whats that didn't have, you know, know they're behind from a hole in the ground and they didn't know this and they didn't know that and he didn't have patience to deal with all this, that, and the other and blah, blah, blah. And after I got to know him more, I realized, I watched how he talked to some of his friends. And I said, whoa, that's it right there. You cannot do the things that you would. And let me finish the statement if you could. The reason is he could, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't. Or he would, but he could. He would if he could, but he can't, so he ain't, so to speak. The problem with him, what held him back, was his mouth, his attitude, his temper, his impatience, his intolerance, and his lack of diplomacy. Whatever was burning in here had to come out, here and now. Didn't matter how it came out. It didn't matter how it was said, but it had to come out. So what he ended up doing was sabotaging his own profession, which was a, he was an actor. But when he was given constructive criticism, fat attitude, Fat attitude, he couldn't handle it. When he was given direction, fat attitude, he couldn't take it. He'd lash out with his tongue. Give them a piece of his mind, 10 pieces of his mind. And then walk away with his chest out because he told them. But what he did with his tongue was slice down and sabotage his own future, his own profession. Why? Because he was incontinent. So he couldn't do the things that he would because of that. There are times when people give you words of correction. There are times when people give you counsel. There are times when people give you suggestions. And instead of you thanking them and appreciating the tips that can make life easier on you, you get upset. You get resentful. You get bitter. Mm-hmm. You want to separate yourself. Why? Because pride, how does the Bible say it? 
Pride comes before a fall and a haughty heart before destruction. And when your pride is in the way, it makes it very difficult to receive and process constructive criticism. It makes it very difficult, very difficult. So what ends up happening is you end up snapping at the very one that's trying to groom you. You end up snapping at your teachers. You snap at your parents. You snap at your boss. You snap at all these different people because your pride doesn't want to deal with certain things. See, pride comes in different colors. Sometimes pride comes in the color of intolerance. You just can't tolerate someone else's weaknesses and faults. They ought to be beyond that by now. That's pride talking. Nobody knows where anyone else ought to be except God, because God knows what you had to navigate to get to where you are now. He knows what you had to navigate through. He knows all the setbacks, the holdbacks, the sabotages that worked against you. He knows that. So he understands why some develop more slowly than others. But when you get to the point where you think somebody ought to be here or somebody ought to be there or you 50 years old, you ought to know better than that. What's the matter with you? You stupid or something? That's abuse. Mm -hmm. And when you are at the point where somebody tries to give you tips and you don't want to hear it, you want the compliments, but you don't want the instruction. You want the strokes, but you don't want the booty whooping. You want the, the compliments and, the, and the, the praise, but you don't want somebody to give you constructive, detailed counsel. Because who are they to talk to me? They don't know me. How dare they? That's pride. That's borderlining haughtiness. We have to be very careful whether we're on the job. Let me tell you, I remember years ago, somebody at the, at the job had told me to do something. And they told me to do it in public. And I asked them if they could discuss that with me privately. And they said, I shouldn't have to say anything. And I said, okay, it might be that you shouldn't have to say anything. I had to pull the person in private. It may be that you shouldn't have to say anything, but I would have appreciated it if, even though I'm wrong, if you could have corrected me in private. That's all. That's all I'm asking. But their response was not, okay, I understand, but next time, please don't do that. And I would have been, well, okay, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. But the way they handled it was, well, I shouldn't have had to tell you. You grown. You got enough sense to know that's not right. That's not sanitary. That's not this. That's not. And they were right about what they said. But the way they handled it was totally disrespectful. And even though I was trying to get them to understand I, I get that I did that wrong. I'll handle that right now. I'll, I'll adjust. I'll make the adjustment, which I did. But what they couldn't understand is what I was saying is a different approach would have made it a lot more palatable. And all they could say to that was, I shouldn't have had to tell you in the first place. Well, see, that's pride. That's self righteousness. Those are the characteristics that are so subtle, we don't see them in ourselves. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. So what ends up happening is you get these little subtle things going on in, in your character. You know, we all get them. We all get those moments. But if we catch them in time, they don't have to manifest. And that's what I'm always asking God to show me because I know where my mind can go. I can be so self-righteous. 
I can be so prideful. I can be so intolerant. And I know it. But I have to keep them, I have to keep all them little foxes under prayer constantly. Lord, don't let me go there. Lord, you know, this is how I feel. And I know that's not godly. Please forgive me, Lord. This is what I want to say, Lord. And I know that's not from your Holy Spirit. That's from my flesh. Help me keep my mouth shut, Lord. Every given second of every given moment of every given day. My father, he would tell me something that I needed to do or I needed to make an adjustment or whatever. And I was fine as long as he said it nicely. But when he didn't say it nicely, I would be embarrassed. And he didn't get it until I mentioned it. But the good thing about him was he listened. He took my feelings into account. And he would say, okay, you're right about that. I could have handled that a little differently. I didn't mean to embarrass you, but you need to quit living in your feelings. You can tell people that till the cows come home, y'all. You, you can tell people you ought to use your brain when you do something. You can tell them all kinds of things, what they ought to, ought to, would have, should have done. But only God can open the eyes. And once you've said it, leave it alone. Don't browbeat. Once somebody has given you counsel or instruction and you don't like what's being said, you need to stop asking their opinion. Because if every time they give you their opinion, if every time they give you insight or word from the Lord or word from the Bible or whatever the case may be, or wisdom, and you don't want to hear it, guess what? You're going to drive all your counselors away because nobody's going to force feed you, baby. All right, let's go to this is what the Lord's leading me to right now. I got this earlier. And I feel like it's time to share it. And it's thundering in my head. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 7. This is what happens to a lot of you people that think you're grown. Mm -hmm. Proverbs chapter 7. You think you're grown. You've been about around the block maybe three times, maybe two and a half. And you think you are an expert on what's happening with you. And this is what God says. See, Satan can get us with the works of the flesh. And I'm going to list them. I'm, I'm going back to, let me go back to Galatians real quick. Because I want to finish that chapter out. I don't want to leave that hanging. All right. Galatians chapter 5. And what we're dealing with are the works of the flesh. I'm only going to work, I'm only going to read the works of the flesh, which are manifest, which are these. And the works of the flesh are, Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. Let me go back to idolatry for a minute. Sometimes we put too much value on ourselves in a very inappropriate manner. And we think our stuff is golden. Our stuff don't stink. So we don't want to hear it. That's idolatry, believe it or not. Pride, arrogance, idolatry, rebellion. What does the Bible say? Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. And boy, we can hate folks that, hmm, yeah, you know how that goes. Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Next thing you know, you're in an argument. You get on the defensive and then you're arguing. Envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings in the such like. Which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, the day which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But 
the fruit of the Spirit is joy, love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperate, self-control, against which there is no law. And they which and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the love. See, you think that it's okay to feel it, but you didn't say it. You think it's okay to think it, but you didn't say it. You think it's okay to fasten to fast uh fantasize or or picture thing going on in your mind, but you didn't act them out. Guess what? What did Jesus say? You lust in your heart, baby. The sin's already committed. And there are times we lust to anger. We lust to rebellion. We lust to arrogance. And lust ain't just about sex, baby. Cakes. Lust is whatever you want to do. You just got to, got to, got to, got to do it. You got to, got to, got to, got to say it. You got to, got to, got to feel it. You got to react this way and react that way. You slap somebody upside the head. They turn you the wrong way, you're going to turn their head, baby. Where does that come from? It's not the spirit of the living God. You got a child that's slow, and you can't wait for them to catch up with the rest of the kids. And you start labeling them slow and stupid and retarded. And what happens what the Bible says you don't do to your child, which has moved them to anger and resentment. Okay, let's go to Proverbs chapter 7. Now this is for you folks that think you, you got it going on. You're walking with the Lord. You're trying. That's good enough. You're trying, right? Check out what Proverbs says. Because while you're trying, you don't want to hear it. Talk to the hand. If you ain't got nothing good to say about me, don't say nothing at all. Well, guess what, baby cakes? You're telling God that when you tell God's servants that. My son, chapter 7, starting at verse 1. My son, keep my words. And lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers. Right upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister. And call understanding thy kinswoman. That they may keep thee from the strange woman. From the stranger which flattereth with her mouth. See, we want the flattery. We don't want the correction. Flattereth with her words. For at the window of my house, I, now picture this, y'all, picture this. I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones, the simple, the simple one is like calling somebody simple-minded. They so, they so stuck on stupid. That's basically what he's saying. Be held among the simple ones or the ignorant or naive ones. That's another way of saying it. Because some people aren't stupid, they're naive. They don't get it. Does not compute. All right. Mm, mm, mm. And be held among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths, a young man, void of understanding, passing through the streets near her corner. Her? Who's her? <laughs> like I did with the with the skit. Who's her? In this case, her is that strange woman. It's, it's a connotation of spiritual luring of the flesh, the works of the flesh. Her. <laughs> near her corner. In other words, hanging around near trouble, near the edge of danger. Mm -hmm. And he went the way to her house in the twilight. In the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So you know we're not talking about a literal woman. For her to lie in wait at every corner 
There's a spirit working, trying to sabotage your progress, sabotage your growth, sabotage your holiness, sabotage your destiny and your future, sabotage you. And beheld, there met him a woman with an attire of an harlot and subtle of heart, and she loud and stubborn, and her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore, come I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works and fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh and aloes and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of loves until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves, for the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He had taken a bag and, uh, with money with him and will come home at the appointed time. With her much fair speech, she caught, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox going to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction at the stocks, till a dart straight through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. Look at that. See, the strange woman can take all kind of forms, y'all. The strange woman can be your pride. The strange woman can be your fleshly desires. The strange woman can be that thing inside of you that always wants to express itself. Express yourself. Dee, 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 dee. Splash yourself. Moving right along. And that strange woman is the thing that wants to pull you away from the things of God, pull you away from the church of God, pull you away from the people of God, pull you away from the messengers of God, pull you away from God. By any means necessary. Because that spirit knows how to manipulate and masturbate your emotions to the point where you become right there in agreement with the demonic forces that are there to destroy everything about you. And because they know how to sing your song, they know how to stroke your ego. They know how to send the right people in your path and make you drawn to the right people that they have set and assigned to pull you down. But it feels good. That's why he says, I've got tapestry. She's got perfumes. Everything's going to smell good. It's going to look good. It's going to sound good. It's going to feel good, baby. Yeah, I got something for you, baby. Come on, I got your flavor. I got your size. I got everything you like. And you're going to go for the okie doke because I know how to present. And you sitting there, oh, 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 what you got for me? Oh, oh, that's good. Oh, yummy, yummy, yummy. Oh, I'm going to get my ego stroke. Oh, they like me. Oh, I'm going to hang out with them. Oh, this is good. Oh, I'm going to hang out. You, listen, years ago, boy, I forgot all about this. Years ago, my ex-husband had his own t-shirt business called Kirk Special Tees. And with his t-shirt business, he had a place in Pasadena. And this place, um, all I knew about it was by day, he worked with developmentally disabled adults. And by night, he worked his business. 
doing the t-shirts, you know, getting out the t-shirts for the fire department, getting out the t-shirts for this department, that department, this organization, that school, whatever. So he's filling orders and he's working it. Now, here's the thing that got me. I knew nothing about what was going on because he was living at the shop. He and I, I had already filed for a divorce, but we were still on speaking terms. So what the Lord did was he gave me a dream. And in this dream, there were people standing on the corner. It was a dark, foggy, misty night. I don't know which ones of you were hanging out with the wrong people, but check this out. I don't know if it's business dealings or what. All right. So these guys were hanging out with him. They were all around the same age, young men. And what ended up happening was I got this eerie foreboding feeling because I'm seeing it from a distance, but I see the details. They're standing under, under some type of a post and the night is dark and foggy and, and, and eerie feeling. And that feeling, that foreboding feeling is all in me. Now, I also have the same, in the same 24-hour uh, period, I believe, I also have a dream that Pat, my friend, and I are cleaning Kirk up. He's standing in a daze, and he doesn't know that he has feces all over his body. And Pat and I are cleaning him up, looking at each other like, doesn't he know what's going on? Doesn't he realize what the, I mean, why is he standing here buck naked with feces all over his body? So we had to clean him up. And, 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 and while we're cleaning him and we're looking at him, I wake up and I told Pat, I called her and told her about the dream and we prayed for him. But what God showed me was that he was hanging with the wrong people that were going to bring him down. And there was something going on in his life he didn't realize was going to I mean, everything about it was dirty. It was like an unclean spirit. It was, it was ridiculous how this thing was going. And what the Lord was showing me was that he was dibbling and dabbling and stuff. That was not godly. He was putting himself in harm's way like the young man in Proverbs chapter 7, who the man could tell was simple-minded, and he was hanging out at her corner near her house, in the dark night and he was putting himself in harm's way because he was drawn by his flesh and leaning to his own understanding and he didn't want to hear correction he didn't want to hear rebuke he didn't want to hear any of that he wanted to be stroked because he had itching ears why did he have itching ears he wanted to be complimented he wanted to be praised oh that's so nice but at the same time he did not want the words of correction. They offended him. So you have to be careful where you are in your life. Because what God is trying to show you is you're at a dangerous point. You're at a dangerous crossroads. He's got his hand on you. He's got a calling on you. And you're sitting up there compromising over here and dabbling over there. And you're playing with trinkets over here. Things that deal with witchcraft. Things that deal with the occult. People that deal with the occult. People that are caught up in sins that are an abomination to God. And you're trying to say, well, they're my friends. And you're trying to be nice to them. And you're trying to be kind to them. And you're trying to hang with them because you're lonely. You're hard up and lonely. And God says it needs to stop. You need to flush it all down the toilet. Your pride, your arrogance, your rebellion, your hunger for all the wrong things and all the wrong people. Your ego. Your hormones. Whatever. You need to flush it down the toilet. Because if you're not careful, you're going to hang around that corner too long. And that will be the end of you. You think it's been bad? Oh, you ain't seen bad till God removes his spirit. And you are in the condition of Ichabod, which means the glory of God has departed. 
And what you ain't seen all hell break loose till God has taken his hand off of your life and said, go on, have it your way. My spirit is not going to strive with you always. And I'm done striving with you now. You don't want to get to that point. You don't. See, you think because we live in the dispensation of grace that everything's okay, you're okay, I'm okay, they're okay, everything's okay, and that's okay. And God's saying it ain't okay. You got to be careful. Oh, my goodness. I totally forgot about that dream with me and Pat cleaning that feces off of Kurt. Totally forgot about that dream. That's been years ago, back in, in the 80s. Well, let me tell you, you guys, God is not playing. And when he starts giving you words of warning, words of admonishment, when he starts telling you stuff, that means it's not going to be much further before the anvil comes down. Just like sitting in a courtroom and that judge, bam, guilty is charged. Sentencing time. You do not want to get to the point where God declares a sentence over you because what he will do is let you and Satan have your way. He'll let you play in all the play yards. He'll let you have all the little buddies you want. He'll let you have all the little demonic toys you want to play with. All the little things you want to dabble in. You want to play with astrology? Play with astrology. That's fine, baby cakes. I'm giving you your freedom. Do what you want to do. It's your thing. Do what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Because, see, God's not going to make you. People try to control, but God's not going to control you, baby. He'll help you by the power of his Holy Spirit. He will empower you, but he's not going to work against your will. And if you don't want it, he's not going to force feed you. He's not going to do that because he is love and love gives freedom. Freedom, love does not control. Love does not dominate. So if you want to tiptoe in the tulips and play with the little weed and play with the astrology and play with the little psychic hotlines and the tarot cards and the candles and the uh, uh, the, the, the incense and the 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 uh, sage or whatever else is out there for you to play with the Ouija boards and oh you go right ahead but don't cry for God's protection when it's time because God's been warning you every step of the way every consequence you've had to deal with that was God's warning now not all of you need this word and I know that. But the bottom line is we all, including myself, we all need to watch our attitude, our feelings. Just because people can't see them doesn't mean God doesn't. See, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But guess what? It also works the other way. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mind thinks, the emotions feel. And just because you're not verbalizing it does not make it not a sin. Just because you're not in the bed with that sister or that brother does not make it not adultery when you're, when you're fantasizing about it. You got the whole scenario, how they going to do this to your body and how they going to do that to your body. And you're talking dirty talk on the phone, but you ain't doing nothing. Yes, you are in God's eyes. See, we think that because we live in this dispensation of grace, we think that there's so much grace and so much forgiveness that we can play, you know, the edge of the envelope as, as we speak. We, you know, we can play on the edge. We can teeter and totter and totter and teeter and tinker and, 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 and dip and, and do all that kind of mess. But guess what? There's going to come a point when you lean to do something or you lean to think something or you entertain a nasty emotion in your heart and God's going to take his hand off and let you act it out. Because trust me, if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we act a whole lot of our stupidity out. And there'll be times when God will lift his spirit long enough for you to get one good, strong whiff of yourself. And you will see the ugly 
that God sees. You will smell the stench that God smells. He talks about it. And then I'm done after this. Isaiah chapter 1. This one right here, you know God is not playing. Isaiah chapter 1, when he talks about stench, mm -hmm, when we think our stuff don't stink, your stinks, your stinks, your stinks. When he, my stuff don't stink, baby. I'm good. I'm me and God, yeah, we good. Yeah, okay, check this out, you and God. Where he says, verse 11. Isaiah 1, verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full. You see that? That means fed up, baby. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and of fat beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hands to tread my courts? Mm -hmm. Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, whoa, I will not hear your, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed. Don't oppress the oppressed, release the oppressed. Judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And I end on that. Let the Lord's word Say what you need to hear in the name of Jesus. I love you. I'm afraid for you. I pray to God spare you, that God open your eyes to the things that are tripping you up and to the things in you that are tripping other people up in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm.